Yeah, so from today, 18th of June, so this is Thursday the 18th of June, from today, it feels, it feels minor, but I think if you think about it, then probably you can, you can make more changes than you perhaps were expecting. So now three families can get together, physically distanced. So, so that would mean you can do drills. As long as you stay two metres apart, you can, you can play football in the park. If you've got a decent garden, you can do that. You no longer have to keep the fence between you and just head the ball back and forward. The three families can now get together. So if you've, got, if you've got three girls in different families who are all in the under-14s club locally, then there's no, absolutely no reason why they couldn't meet in the park with or without parents to, to train and drill. They just can't have contact yet. But the physical activity and fitness elements of it, I think, are really, really important. And, we, and we, should, we should absolutely encourage that. The other thing that happened today, and this is a slightly more complex one, is that if you live alone or you are a single parent with kids, you can now join up with another family of your choice, just one family, and you can behave like one household. So let's take for... Let's, Let's take an example. There's a 12 year old boy who lives with his mum, just the two of them, and they they have been isolated pretty much for this period. And he's been he's been playing football just by himself. He can now choose with mum, of course, got to check. He can choose another family to link with, and that that could create a family of five, a family of six. It could create a, two two families. They can they don't have to physically distance. They can stay. They can have sleepovers, and they can train together. They could have. They could have contact training, like like two brothers or a brother and a sister. So I know not everybody's in that situation, but but if people use that imaginatively, then that might be one of the ways to get back to a little bit more physical activity for some people. I know I know it'll be a minority and not much consolation for some others. So most people, the three family thing, I think they should start to use. And for some people, maybe a lower number, they can start to do what we're calling the social bubble thing. Now, you'll need to persuade your mum or your dad that you don't want to use that social bubble thing to visit your grandparents. So that might get a bit controversial. But it, maybe if you're going to spend it on football training, you'd, you're going to have to check that with mum and dad a little bit. The crucial step is when are we going to allow physical distancing to be reduced even for a temporary period? Now, it's impo- this is important. People haven't quite understood this, I don't think. If you watch the Bundesliga or if you watch La Liga now or even the Premiership, the only time those players are not physically distanced is when they're playing. So in the changing rooms, in the canteens, in the, in the journeys, they are still physically distanced. You see what I mean? Yeah. So they've reduced the risk only, uh, they've reduced the risk everywhere except on the pitch. So, th- so that is another advantage of professionals. So we're going to have to get to a point, and all of the professional organizations, the SFA and others, have, have got a stepped plan, a phased plan to what that will look like for grassroots football, for, for rugby, for swimming, for snooker, for, for everything you could imagine. And, and we will consider those. We'll put them through our kind of public health permission thing that's, that, that looks through all of those documents and give permission. The one thing I can't give you is when that will be. I can tell you that three-week reviews are very important. So this virus works in three-week chunks. So you, you, it takes you, about, takes you about a week to show any symptoms. It takes about a week for you to get very sick. And then if you're going to be really sick and in hospital, that takes about another week. So three weeks is really important for us. So today, 18th of June, is a review day. And you can see all the, all, everything that's happened today. The next three-week review is kind of, I forget, I think it's the 8th of July, three weeks from now. is about the 8th, 9th of July. That will be very important. Now, I'm not going to tell you we're going to move to phase three on the 8th of July. But I can tell you that on that date, there will be a formal review and we will, we will be hopeful that we can progress. So grassroots football is not forgotten. It is inside the judgments that we're making about tourism, about sport, about businesses going back, and it will be in the considerations for that, and we will get, we will get you back just as soon as we can, as soon as it's safe to let you back.
So my understanding is 700,000 of this population in Scotland are connected in some way to grassroots football. Families, players, coaches, people who make the orange juice at, at halftime, wh whatever it is, to clubs and the community elements of those clubs. That's a fantastic proportion and a huge power that that group have to maintain the guidelines as they are just now, not, not just for their own sake, but for the sake of the reward that's coming. So the reward that's coming is the first minister will be able to stand up and say, we are moving to the next stage of the route map. And grassroots football, as, as well as independent retail, the oil and gas sector, theatres and cinemas, and everything else that we need to open up to get back to how we used to live, will, will be crucial. So, so the power the SFA have and those connected to you to get us through those phases, I, I think is absolutely crucial. I think it's astonishing what has been achieved in the country. One of the things we shouldn't take away, pandemics are not good. Pandemics are misery, misery. But one of the things we shouldn't take away is that community engagement and sometimes the acceleration of that. I've, I heard an example this week because I've got a pal in Edinburgh whose sister volunteers at Spartans. And uh, they've been doing, three of her kids have been involved in the, I think it's food parcels and volunteering they've been doing around their local community, taking them to shielded people, some vulnerable in the community. I mean, that, that's fantastic. That, that's a real community asset that happens to be a football club. I mean, it, it, could, it could be anything. It could be a faith-based environment. It could be a homeless shelter. It happens to be a football club. And I, I think that's really important. Fo football gets, even in the last couple of days, get, gets bad press when it deserves it often, but also should get good press. For, for some of those community-based initiatives that it does. And I would encourage people to, to continue to do that even when they get back to the full competitive sport. There's still time in the week, I think, to do both of those things. I think the two meter, one meter thing has become a, a it's important, but it's, it's become in the last 10 days slightly too important. Than, than quite a lot of other elements. So the, right now, or on this Thursday, the two meter distance is, is absolutely crucial. At this level of prevalence of the virus, we've still got 3,000 people infected with this virus in the community. I've got 800 people in hospital with this virus, still got about 20 people in intensive care. Now that, that's, gonna, that's gonna hopefully go down pretty dramatically over the next little while. So, when the prevalence of the virus in the community is down at a really low level, then we will, we will be able to think about, you can start to go indoors, you can start to distance less, we can start to open shops in, inside uh, shopping centers. So, so everything comes up for grabs then. We just don't know when because we can't control the virus completely. We can't control the timing of the virus. So I, I mean, we, we don't two meter distance for the flu. The flu kills 500,000 people a year around the world. So we're, we're going to have to learn to live with this infectious disease. But right now, we're still in the middle of a global pandemic. And the public health advisors like me are still too worried to let that go yet. But over time, I think it, I think it will be let go. Um, and it, it might be two meters to one and a half, two meters to one. It might be that for the purposes of contact sport, you are allowed to have physical contact during the game, but you've got to separate on the subs bench and you've got to separate when you're traveling. You can't use public, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be, there'll be a variety of things. And we'll try with the SFA and others to provide really, really good guidance about what that will look like. The, the last thing I want to happen is we, we go now, let's say, and somebody gets the virus. So th that would set us back weeks if not months so we've got to be so careful about when when we give the go-ahead for each individual stage we've got to be sensible so there's some things we know about this virus now that we we didn't know before and some things we don't know so so people can't have can't have missed a lot of this probably although i imagine not everybody's watching the first minister's press briefing every day 
like I have to. But the the outdoors is better than indoors. So so it do, the virus the virus doesn't like circulating air, and it doesn't like sunlight. So the worst possible place for this virus, it, it's and I shouldn't do this because I'll alienate a section of the community. Nightclubs are a disaster. So enclosed, full of people, noisy. So you shout and you spray your saliva over people. Do you see what I mean? So that that kind of warm dark, enclosed space is a disaster. So the opposite of that is good. Wide open space, big playing fields, lots of air, sun is good, humidity is good because the virus doesn't like any of that. So that would mean that if you're going to think about how you bring football back, you're, you're not going to start with indoor five-a-sides, changing rooms and indoor gyms. That's not where you're starting. You're going to start with big open space, Hamden's outdoor park, Murrayfield's open pitches, that kind, of, that kind of place first, with lots of space for physical distancing. Training can be separate. Even the professional training is still very physically distanced just now, but they're doing it outdoors. Murrayfield has moved its gym equipment into outdoor gyms so they can do some strength conditioning, but it's not indoors yet. And then eventually, we'll have to move to using a little bit more of the indoor facility, but we're quite away from, for instance, opening up indoor gyms to, yeah. to, allow, to allow folk to do strength conditioning indoors. So I, I think that will be a gradual return to, to normality. And eventually, we'll get back to indoor five-a-sides, badminton indoors, all those, all those other things you would expect. So... It, it'll, so it's quite a lot of these things run in parallel, of course. So it's a bit like saying we're going we're gonna to reopen factories, but you can't get on the train. So, you, so you've, got to do them, you've got to do them kind of at the same time. So one of the things we'll have to consider is when we open uh, outdoor pitches, outdoor courts, what are you allowed to do on those outdoor courts? And right now we'd ask people to use common sense. So the, so the Botanic Gardens is open. People, could, people can go and kick a football around at the Botanic Gardens or Queen's Park or whatever, whichever green space is close to you. Um, there's probably not going to be police telling you that you've got four families, but we would like you not to have. And not because we're killjoys, but because we need to suppress the virus. And we've made a judgment about what's allowed and what's not allowed. So when we open pitches, I think we will do that before that you're allowed to play fully competitive games with, with spectators watching, with your families all lined up on the side shouting and balling. I, I, th I think it will be progressive. I think it will be opened for training, non-contact first, then gradually bigger groups, then gradually into contact, and then gradually back to games. And I, I know people are desperate for us to say, yep, that will be on Tuesday night on the 8th of August. But that's, that's the single question I, I can't yet answer for you. But I'm hopeful because if most people have behaved themselves up to this point. The numbers are down. The numbers in the health service are going in the right direction. The viral prevalence is reducing. And I'm very hopeful that we're going to move through the phases just as fast as we can. Every, every sector is different. I mean, I, I spoke this week to some colleagues in the oil and gas industry, and it's very different, and the tourism industry is different. So sport, I'm afraid, if you think sport is normal, you've misunderstood. It's not normal. So, so it's going to take us a bit of time to get back to what we remember as normal. And that, that's going to be at different paces for different sports and for different bits of the sport. In the end, the, the the tricky news is that professional sport is always going to be able to go quicker than grassroots and schoolboy and girl sports, whatever, whatever sport it is, particularly contact sports, because they have advantages. They, they can create public health bubbles in which everything is much more protected. So to use a non-football example, horse racing is going to restart uh, in Scotland on Monday. It restarted at Ascot, you probably saw during the week. So they can create 300 people who 
are not in touch with anybody else, who are basically physically distanced from everything in the stadium and from their, their families. So they're, they're kind of living as this 300-person thing that's moving around the country as, a, as an entity. And we know that that's virus-free. That, that can only work for a Formula One Grand Prix or a Glasgow Edinburgh rugby game or a Hearts Hibs football game. So that, that will be possible for professional football. But it won't be possible even for lower league football because people have jobs. People, people have to have contact with other human beings. And that's why grassroots is, that, grassroots is just that little bit more difficult. It's coming. So, don't, so don't, don't lose hope. That's the most important thing. And there's things we can do, and we'll get to that question, I'm sure. Things we can do now that are allowed that weren't allowed yesterday. And there will be things allowed in three weeks' time all being well, if we get a fair wind and the virus stays suppressed, there'll be things allowed in three weeks' time that aren't allowed today. And if you have me back in six weeks' time, I think it'll be different again. So, so we're on that trajectory like, like the rest of the country.